morning, everyone, and welcome. I greet you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. As we gather together on this beautiful day, there's a little bit of a promise of maybe a little rain this week. Uh, so we know the ladies had a great day yesterday at the uh, ladies' retreat, and Brenda's words were encouraging, and uh, I've heard nothing but good about the day. And so thank you to all the ladies who participated and planned. I know there was a lot of <laughs> ahead of time. And to the guys who went to the gut show, we had a good day as well. No uh, tension. What's that? No tension. No, no tension. tension. It was relaxed. We had a good day. Burger King was nice. That, uh... All right. Let us pray. We are praying people. So I invite you to bow your heads. And as the Lord just leads you, pray for one another or as you're guided. And then I'll pray for you. Father, every morning we awake and we proclaim and witness, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. This day, we rejoice. In this place built for your glory, we gather a place of safety and worship, a place of community, the family of God to gather in your presence. We thank you for that. So we bring who we are, the good that we've had, the struggles that we've had, the weight that we carry, that we might find release, and we might find freedom in this morning. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to take a bulletin that Chris handed to you as you walk in. And just draw your attention to a couple of things you'll see this week. Uh, Club DJ, are we still rolling, Dylan? Good. Delana, we're still got ladies' Bible study? It's not at Shirley's Oh, okay. All right. So everybody knows where it is, though? Not yet. Not yet. Okay, you'll, you'll figure that out and let them know. All right, good. Prayer meeting and Bible study continue thir Thursday's food bank. Keith, youth group, club club DJ. Yeah. Clue night coming up. Anything yeah. you want to add? Clue night this, uh, this Friday at the church. Uh, it's going to be wild, wonderful, and wacky. So it's going to be We look forward to wild, wonderful, and wacky. Uh, men's breakfast is going on. I know some of the guys are going down to... Do you want to mention that? anything about that, Dylan, or no? Yeah, we're going down to Broken Arrow. Um, looks like the weather's going to hold for us, but they're doing that work, men's work for three steps around the Bible Mountain there. So that's a solid three and a half hour drive. They got, they want to have guys come and they're willing to accommodate and stay for several nights. But I think there's four or five of us going right now. Um, we're planning on Friday after work and coming home probably Saturday at the end of the day. So just staying one night there. But um, yeah, they're going to show up, they're going to work. They're doing a mile and a half fence and we're doing welding and construction and shingles and all sorts of manly things. So um, Todd um, that spoke here a couple, oh, about a month ago now, yeah. he wants numbers as soon as possible. So if you're coming, let me know this week so that, I can, so that they can be prepared for us. Good. Great. And there still will be men's breakfast at the hangar though on Saturday morning. Uh, we'll get some guys cooking and we'll uh, go from there. Other than that, uh, there are a few things, but I will leave that with you. Have I missed anything? Well, then, as we learned in Sunday school, if you don't enjoy good music, just you're a donkey. So, uh, <laughs> sorry, Martin Luther quote that I won't finish completely. So we'll go from there. Dale. This is one time that I'll say that Dan's paraphrase is not even as good as the original quote. So you may want to look up Martin Luther's uh, views on music. So um, stand with us this morning as we join in uh, worship. I know, what? yes, dear. I know of uh, one birthday for sure. Are there any other birthdays this week that I was not informed of? All right. Well, I do know that we have Brian's 70th birthday was Monday or Tuesday. <laughs> and I heard it was the 8th, so I think that's Monday? 10th. 10th. Oh, there we go. So Brian turned 70 this week, so those of you that are more energetic than that, let's sing happy birthday to Brian this morning. Happy birthday. get into worship this morning if you want to follow along in your hymnals it's number 499 since Jesus came into my heart no it's fine <laughs> <laughs> 
From uh, Psalm 16, verses 9 to 11. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body will also rest secure, because you will not abandon me to the grave, nor will you let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand.
Great songs of declaration. Good. We, uh, we talked a lot Sunday school about what music is and declaration and revelation and then testimony that we sing. So. It is my privilege to pray for you. We know that our sister Shirley's sadly her walker's here today, but we, we keep going to pray for her. And we've got a couple of people carrying people. Oh, there you both right in line right there. That, uh, so we want to pray for a continued protection as pregnancies continue along and a variety of other things. So let's pray. Amazing grace that you've done for us, not that we are capable, Father, we gather. We gather with joy in our hearts because of your grace towards us, because the land is turning green for the moment, the promise of a little bit of rain on the horizon, and we ask that there be so much more in the days to come. We thank you for the health of the little ones in the room and the growing health of two new little ones that are coming along slowly. We pray for protection for Chris and Linnea as they... Elena, as they continue on in their life and their growth. Father, we pray for future, for Shirley as decisions have to be made, for Danny as he goes for surgery, and for others who head off to school in the fall, each one. Father, we ask that grace be abundant and overwhelming in their world. Father, this morning particularly, we think of Israel and the attacks last night that have gone on, and what that means for them as a nation, and what that means politically for the stability of that era, and we pray that peace would reign over. But until that day, Father, we ask for protection and for justice for each one. We pray for the release and continued release of the captives that are still being held there. And then, Father, for the secrets of our hearts, the things we haven't talked about this day or shared with anybody, these we bring for you and ask that your amazing grace would once again touch us. We pray all this in Jesus' name. I'll ask our ushers to come forward. Again, as we continue to sing our songs of declaration right now, you got it. praises to our Lamb who is the greatest. Goodness of God. Yeah. 
kids, welcome back. I'm glad you could make it. Today I want to talk to you about the importance of staying focused. You know, sometimes when we're having fun, we tend to get distracted and forget to follow set rules. This can end in disaster. About a month ago I was on my way to Lethbridge and a truck pulled out across a solid line to pass a semi that was coming at me at 100 kilometers an hour. I immediately moved over to the shoulder. The truck was only halfway past the semi as we all met up. If I'd been texting or looking away even just for a split second, I wouldn't be here right now. Crashes are not fun, I know. One of the main things they teach you in driver's ed is to pay attention to what you're doing. Follow the rules of the road and stay focused. As I thank the Lord for protecting me, I couldn't help but think, just as distractions can be deadly on the road, so can distractions be harmful to us in our spiritual lives. Sin is a major distraction and causes us to take our eyes off of Jesus. We lose focus and we're carried away by our own desires. But it's not just sinful things that compete for our attention. Life is so busy these days, people scurrying about. The world has a knack for waving its arms and saying, hey, look over here. <laughs> Someday you'll probably buy a house of your own, and then you'll have to go shopping for all kinds of stuff to fill your lovely home. This takes a lot of money. So you'll have to balance your home life and your career. And when you start a family, your kids may have sports games that they need to get to, and of course, homework that you'll have to make sure they do. There's absolutely nothing wrong with all of these things, just as long as you're making time for God in your day. Start each new day by thanking Him for the many blessings you've received, and ask Jesus to help you to stay focused on Him and to help you to do all the tasks in your day to the very best of your ability. Colossians 3.23 says, Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart, as working for the Lord, not for human masters. Sometimes people become so busy making a comfortable life for themselves and their families here on earth that they neglect to take the time to prepare for eternity. There's nothing more important in this life than your relationship with Jesus. So remember kids, stay focused on Him. And whatever you find yourself doing, don't get so distracted traveling through life that you force Jesus into the back seat. Let Him take the wheel. Have an awesome week, stay safe, and we'll see you again. What is this, kids? Absolutely, a kids' church with Mrs. Hutt and Jack is downstairs too. So if you guys head down to Kids Church normally, get going. So I, uh, Danny was supposed to be reading scripture this morning, as you can see he's not here, so he texted me and asked if I'd read scripture for him. He said it was uh, Haggis chapter 1 um, and I said I definitely can, I'm not familiar with the book, but if it's in your Bible I'm sure it's in mine too, but he said no, it's, it's Haggai. So. If, uh, if you'd like to turn in your, in your Bibles, I'll be having with you to the book of Haggai. It is the third last book of the Old Testament. I had a heck of a time finding it. It's only two pages long. So please uh, grab your Bibles, turn there, and, uh, and stand with me uh, for the reading of the Word. Haggai chapter 1, the first 11 verses. In the second year of Darius the king, on the first day of the sixth month, the word of the Lord came by the prophet Haggai to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, This people says, The Lord, the time has not come, even the time for the house of the Lord to be rebuilt. Then the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet, saying, Is it time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses while this house lies desolate? Now therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. You have sown much, but harvest little. You eat, but there is not enough to be satisfied. You drink, but there is not enough to become drunk. You put on clothing, but no one is warm enough. And he who earns, earns wages to put into a purse with holes. Thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Go up to the mountain, bring wood, and rebuild the temple that I may be pleased with it and be glorified, says the Lord. 
You look for much, but behold, it comes to little. When you bring it home, I blow it away. Why? declares the Lord of hosts. Because of my house which lies desolate, while each of you runs to his own house. Therefore, because of you, the sky has withheld its dew, and the earth has withheld its produce. I called for a drought on the land, on the mountains, on the grain, on the new wine, on the oil, on what the ground produces, on men, on cattle, and on all, they la all the labor of your hands. You may be seated. By the way, if you're at Walmart at Medicine Hat, you can bump into Mark Weber. He's there. You'll sometimes see him around. He doesn't usually have the Darth Vader shirt on, but he's the Walmart guy. Let's pray. Father, look at our hearts, our minds, our will, our strength, all that we are, so that we can begin to understand a portion, a wonderful portion, of who you are. We thank you now for this time together. In Jesus' name. Amen. Freedom. We long for it. We fight for it. We fight over it. And if you abuse it, well, freedom can be taken away. Your freedom to swing your fist extends as far as your neighbor's face. Your freedom to drive your vehicle extends as far as your neighbor's fence. Freedom can often be restricted. But we know this, that we as people thrive best in freedom. Many of us grew up in homes where freedom wasn't always uh, at the forefront. Uh, my grandfather was Edwardian English. Children were not allowed to speak in his presence. We were not allowed to eat at the table with him. We would eat by ourselves somewhere else and only when spoken to were we allowed to speak. Now my brother and I were a bit like the Wall Boys and uh, we had difficulty with that restriction on our freedom. And so we locked horns with grandpa on more than one occasion because we, wanted to be free. When I was in school, I didn't sit well in school. I liked being free, so they would make me sit on my hands and limit my freedoms. That drove me crazy. I became a pastor so I could stand up and walk around in church while you have to sit. I like the freedom of this. Freedom. So this morning, I want to tell you a story. The story of freedom lost, freedom found, and freedom wasted, because you know we can waste our freedom. Turn with me, as Dylan said, to the book of Habakkuk. I've never heard it called the book of Haggai. Hag no, Haggai, Haggus, the Irish, the Scottish book. No, it is, as he said, the third last book. We begin in this story of Haggai, now you've got me thinking Haggis, but Haggai, with freedom lost. And I need to set the background a bit, the stage. In 975 BC, a long time ago, the 12 tribes of Israel split up. Ten went north and two stayed south. Remember, ten and two, just like your driver's instructor told you. And 254 years later, in 721, uh, the ten northern tribes went into captivity under Assyria. Now let's see how much we've been paying attention for the last few years. Everybody remember, A is for? B is for? Babylon. P is for? G is for? The big dip is a blank, and then, oh, wow, I, I'm earning my salary. PG, good. Persia. They go into captivity under the Assyria. Then 124 years later, in 597 BC, the southern two are captured and taken into captivity in Babylon. Israel, who was to be free, finds themselves in captivity. Freedom lost. As one author put, the survivors were dragged into a foreign country, and the scorched earth that once had been their home was left empty and desolate. This sets the stage for our story of freedom. Freedom first, lost. And then, 70 years later, freedom found. In 539 BC, under Cyrus the Great, he gave the great command, return to Jerusalem, be free. Initially, 50,000, we know for the records, and that's probably a, a summary number, 50,000 returned, but over the next 110 years, more and more, countless generations returned to Israel, to Jerusalem. <clears throat> and they returned now to a self-governing province. They were given the land back, the city back, they were given a governor who was responsible to 
the, the king, but himself could run the land as he chose. So imagine, imagine you're 70. Oh, that should not be hard for this section over here. But imagine you're 70, and all you've known is slavery your entire life. You were born into slavery, exile. And yet, despite that, they thrived in their slavery. We know that Israel thrived in Babylon. There, the great Sanhedrin, the 70, came into power and expanded and explained and opened the scriptures to the people. One of the greatest schools of the ancient world that we have records of was Jewish at that time. We know that from archaeology that they lived in many communities and often kept to themselves. We know today that there was an area that's translated into English as Judah Town. Uh, if you've been to Calvary, you might think of Chinatown, a cultural uh, area. And so there's two, this community we know from the records. They owned property, large tracts of land. They were made royal officials. We know that from Daniel. Interestingly enough, it was only the Jews that, whose culture survived captivity under the Babylonian Empire. All the rest were assimilated into Babylon, but they remained themselves. And so when the order came to return under Cyrus the Great, we know roughly 50,000 left and 80,000 stayed. But for those 50,000, freedom. Freedom, finally, after 70 years, finally free. They can govern themselves, build what they want. I heard recently that prelate is now part of the RM. It's no longer a town bearer, right? Is it recording? Not yet. Not yet, but it's going to be, right? Freedom. You can have chickens now. <laughs> you can raise a sheep on your yard if you want. You can build as high as you want, as wide as you want. You don't have to go through the temple. You don't have to set in a requisition for your debt. Courtney can have chickens. It's great. Freedom. We long for it. And so imagine free to govern, to build what you want, when you want, where you want, what you want, and have all the chickens you want. They can worship, speak, live the way they want. Isn't that what we long for? Freedom. We always lived in town, and we came out to later and lived on the acreage. Freedom. It's so wonderful. You're free. After years, free at last. So what did they do with their freedom? They built houses for themselves, which leads us to freedom wasted. It leads us the book of Haggai. A little background before we explore the book, just a little this morning, and then we will more in the coming weeks. Haggai's name means the festival of God. Great name for your kid, by the way. A celebration of God. It's part of what's called the Twelve. There are twelve minor prophets, and the number twelve was chosen specifically, the number of completeness, and they all fit on one big Torah scroll, or one big scroll. Um, and it's a series of four sermons that are non-poetic. It's just a really, just a guy talking. There's no poetry or songs. Uh, he's mentioned in Ezra 5 and Ezra 6 and in Zechariah 8, so we know he's a real person as part of the history. And in chapter 2, verse 3, we know that he is 70, so that's good, kind of Murray and Brian country. Um, and the book is dated from the first day of the sixth month, right? If you look at verse, chapter 1, verse 1, on the 24th day of the ninth month in chapter 2, we get very specific dates, so this book is rooted in the history of Israel. We know that it was four years before the second temple was finished in 560. So we have all these historical uh, reference points to know the exactness of the book. Well, the book is basically four sermons. And again, we'll be looking at those in the weeks to come. And I won't go through the outline with you, but that's kind of what Haggai does. But let me address it in the broadest sense. Haggai comes back in the first wave of exiles returning. And in the midst of their freedom, he sees... A problem. Remember we said earlier on, you can abuse your freedom. You can drive as far as your neighbor's fence. Take a look at chapter 1, verses 2 to 4. This is what the Lord of Armies says. That's Haggai's great name for God. This people, says, the first time has not come, and the time for the house of the Lord to be rebuilt. Then the word of the Lord came to Haggai the prophet, saying, Is it time for yourselves to live in paneled houses while this house remains desolate? We'll pick it up at verse 8. Go up to the mountains, bring wood, rebuild the temple, that I may be pleased with it and be honored. You start an ambitious project, but behold, it comes to little when you bring it home. I blow it away. Why, declares the Lord? It's because of my house, which remains desolate, while each of you runs to his own house. 
They had been given instruction to come home and to build the temple. This story takes place, or this event, takes place 18 years after the founding of the temple. They had been working on this project for 18 years and had been left in ruin. This foundation was laid, but that was pretty much all they had done. We don't know why they hadn't kept working. Maybe it was political, economic, maybe it was apathy. For some reason, though, we just know the actions. The temple was not finished, but their homes were. So instead of building God's temple, they were building a Haggai says panel. Uh, the word there is rather extravagant and well-to-do homes for themselves. And for this action, for this abuse of their freedom, we'll say, or this misuse of their freedom, God takes them to task. Verse 5. Now then, the Lord of armies says, consider your ways. I love this phrase. It means put your heart on the road. That it's considered. Think about it. Feel where you're heading. See and sense the direction of your life. Get your heart out there and see the road you're on. It's more than an intellectual assessment. It's actually God says, feel what you've done and the direction of your life. In essence, he says, check your personal and collective motives for the inactivity of building my temple. So what happened? After coming home, they started well. They laid the foundation, but for whatever reason, for 18 years, and it stalled, and they turned into their own selfish interests and their own needs. Those who had lost their freedom now had found their freedom. And what did they do with their freedom? They were using it for their own benefit. They were using freedom for their own gain. And they discovered that God had not given them freedom so they could use it for themselves. This morning we find ourselves, I trust, in a similar situation. I trust you find yourself free this morning. I know many of us were raised in rather restrictive backgrounds. And we say, you know, enough, this church thing, it's just a bunch of rules and laws. And I hope that through the, what we've said over the last few years has reinforced and given you hope that we are here for freedom. Freedom. In 1942, in the movie Holiday Inn, Bing Crosby sang, and I'm not going to try because Bing just better than the rest of us. He said, I'm singing the song of freedom for all people who cry out to be free. Free to sail the seven seas, free to worship as they please. If the birds up in the trees can be free, why can't we? Sons of freedom far and near who agree, sing with me that all God's children shall be free. Bing was right. This is the song we sing, and I trust we have sung it well, that all God's children are to be free. You see, we flourish when we're free. This freedom is the very foundation of Jesus' ministry. This is why Jesus came, and we'll see in a moment where he proclaims that. But let me read you just a few verses. We've been studying this in Romans. Romans 6, for the one who has died is free from sin. Romans 8, that creation itself also will be set free from slavery. Jesus in John 8, 31 and 32. So Jesus was saying to those Jews who believed in him, if you continue in my word, then you are truly my disciples. And you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. John 4.18, or sorry, John 8.36. So if the Son sets you free, you're really free indeed. And then Jesus stands up at the beginning of his ministry, and he says, this is what I'm all about. Well, he actually sits down to read. And he reads the prophet Isaiah. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives, recovery sight to the blind, and to set free those who are down the trodden. You see, in a Roman world where slavery was so rampant, some estimate that as high as 30% of the Roman Empire was enslaved. Others around 10%. Depends on what you read. But let's face it, in a world where 3 out of 10 or 1 in 10 had no freedom, Jesus comes along and says, hey, I'm here for freedom. And Jesus goes out with this message of freedom. You will be free. And so there arose a question. What do we do with freedom? You ever drive in the Walmart parking lot? Freedom. You go where you want. You kind of park where you want. I have a very little car. And I get up to these F-350s that are beside me. And I look at them and think someday I'll be that tall. 
<laughs> you don't stand a chance. It's freedom. It's whoever has the biggest truck and the most aggression makes freedom and makes the choice, right? You end up parking where you shouldn't want to park. That's freedom, and freedom brings risk, and freedom has consequences, and freedom is also tied, often tied to power or to submission back and forth. Freedom can be chaotic, and freedom can be fearful to be free. So what do we do with freedom? Take your Bibles with me this morning again, and now turn to Romans chapter 14. Haggai establishes what we're looking at. That is, people who return to freedom took their freedom and used it for selfish purposes, and God condemned that use of freedom. So what is the proper use of freedom? Well, Romans 14, which we're studying in Bible study, uh, will guide us into that. I'm just going to read it because context is critical. Romans 14, starting in verse 5. We're just going to read seven verses. One person values one day over another. And another value is every day the same. Each person must be fully convinced in their own mind. The one who observes the day observes it for the Lord. The one who eats does so with regard for the Lord. For they give thanks to God, and the one who does not eat, it is for the Lord that they don't eat, and they give thanks to God. For not one of us lives for themselves, and not one of us dies for themselves. For if we live, we live for the Lord. If we die, we die for the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or we can tell what Paul was a lawyer, by the way. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Jesus died and lived again, so that he might be the Lord of both the dead and the living. And here's the critical one, verse 10. But as for you, why do you judge your brother or sister? Or you as well, why do you regard your brother or sister with contempt? For we will all appear before the judgment seat of God. It is written, as I live, says the Lord, to me every knee will bow and every tongue will give praise. So then, each one of us will give an account of himself to God. So what is Paul saying here in regards to freedom? Paul picks one issue, holidays or holy days. Some people regard one day as holy. So today we come on this, the Lord's Day, the first day of the week. And we set this day aside. We say, this is a holy day. The next person doesn't. The scripture says, well, why are you treating one person with one regard and the other with not? We as a community have said, Sundays, this is a holy day for us. We <coughs> operate and we exercise our freedom to choose to do this. That's freedom. One person has a holy day and one doesn't. He says, you're free to choose. The one who observes the day observes it to the Lord. We are doing that. We are observing this day unto the Lord. But the one who doesn't, as long as they do the same, he really says it's up to you. That's a staggering thought. We're free. And he sums it up in verse 10. In your freedom, don't judge another person's freedom. But tucked in the middle is how we use that freedom. And here's the awakening point for us. Verses 7 and 8. For not one of us lives for himself, and not one of us dies for himself. Freedom is not for our own purposes. We don't use our freedom for ourselves. For if we live, we live for the Lord. We use our freedom for the Lord. Or if we die, that's a free choice as well. We die for the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, what choice we make is made for the Lord. Freedom, the exercise of choice, is to be made under the hand of God, as all of life is. He sums it up in verse 19. So then we pursue things which make for peace and the building up of others. Ah, there's the focus. So the choices we make with our freedom should result in peace and the building up of one another. Make peace and build one another. One author writes this, one's personal freedom and biblical understanding must lead to stability and the growth of the body. Simone de Beauvier writes this, a free person is one whose end is the liberation of themselves and others. A free person uses their freedom, yes, to bring liberty and freedom for themselves, but also to bring freedom to another person, and she's absolutely right. Freedom is to be used to make others free. We go back to John chapter 4, and we see Jesus' opening declaration of his mission. What did he use his freedom for? The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Bring good news to the poor. The poor need to have freedom from want. He says, to proclaim release to the captives, the slave needs to be free from their chains. Recovery of sight to the blind, the blind need to be free from their darkness. And to set free those who are oppressed, black and white. Freedom. Jesus says, I have come that you 
might be free. Here is the one who made the grass upon which we walk, whose feet were nailed to the cross. The one who made the heavens and earth became a prisoner in Roman chains. Here is the one who knew no sin that we might become his righteousness. Here is the one who gave up his freedom so that we could be free. Jesus models this for us so clearly. But the purpose of freedom is to make others free. And so Bing was right. If the birds up in the trees can be free, why can't we? What does a mother bird use her freedom for? To build a nest for her babies. She uses her freedom to give life to her family. A mother gives up her freedom. Boy, that's poignant right now. Sorry, I keep looking down the center of this aisle here. You know, a mother gives up her freedom, freedom of movement. And I don't know, I've never been pregnant, don't know. But rumor has it that a lot of freedom is given up so that another life can be free. This is God's model. And I believe that God gives us gifts. He gives us freedom. He gives us strength. He gives us wisdom. He gives us resources. He gives us abilities. Not so that we can build up our own kingdom, but so that we can equip and give others freedom and life. Haggai says this, Go up to the mountains, bring wood, and rebuild the temple, so that I may be pleased and with it honored. When we give up our freedoms and another might have freedom, we honor God. We're strong. Not so that we can be strong, but so that we can set others free. To be honest, I, I'm not picking on you. I, I want my EMT to be strong, to be honest, because when I'm laying in the ditch, I want him to be able to pick me up, carry me, and put me on that board and be free. I want his strength to rescue me. Nothing against little people who are EMTs, but I want strong EMTs. I want people who are skilled at what they do to work where they work. We use our strength so that we can, in turn, strengthen others. We're wise, not so that the smartest guy in the room. No, so that we can share that and others can come to understanding that Meg and Meg welding are two different things. We come to these understandings. We are given gifts of building and working and well and all these things. Why? So that we can build our own little kingdoms? No, let me read to you from Exodus chapter 31, verses 2 through 5. This is a great little passage. Exodus 31. See, I have called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah, very specifically who this dude was. And listen. I have filled him with the Spirit of God in wisdom and understanding and in knowledge. Sounds like he's a teacher, right? Wisdom and understanding and knowledge. But let me keep. I have filled him with the Spirit of God in wisdom, understanding and knowledge, in all kinds of craftsmanship, to create artistic designs for work in gold, in silver, in bronze, in the cutting of stones, for settings, in the carving of wood, so that he may work in all kinds of craftsmanship. The Spirit of God came upon this man so he could work with wood and work with stone and gold and silver. It was actually the gift of the Spirit, his craftsmanship which made the temple beautiful. Why did the Spirit give him so many skills so that he could start a little business on the side selling gold pictures of the... No, no, so he could come into the temple and make it beautiful. Some of you are wise in steel and wood. Others in pastry and piano. Others in the healing of the mind or healing of the body. And God has made you strong and abundant in these skills. My notes wrote this this week. I have seen you work in metal, and there's a certain freedom you have with it. While some of us are slaves to our own inabilities, your tools move with freedom over the steel. That's freedom. Some of us, it's not free. We pick it up, we have no idea what we're doing. But God has gifted you to be free, and what do you use it for? Freedom to make a better world. Galatians 5, 1 says this, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Freedom for what purpose? To build paddle houses for ourselves? No, he says, go up to the mountains, bring wood, rebuild the temple, so that I may be pleased and honored. Let's wrap this up. We see that all too many people use their freedom for their own purposes, their own benefits. They build their own kingdoms. They view freedom as a, a toy to amuse and entertain their paneled houses. But beloved, freedom is a tool that God gives us. 
So then we pursue the things which make for peace and the building up of one another. This gift of freedom, whether it's freedom over metal or freedom over the mind, whatever God has gifted you with, the purpose of those gifts and that freedom is so that you can build up the kingdom of peace and one another. This is a very well-preserved 1967 Eaton's catalog. Before there was the internet, there was Eaton's. And I want to turn to one of my favorite pages. I wish I had PowerPoint to work on that. This is page 35. Johnny West is on the corner. $3, as seen on TV. What's Johnny word? $3.69. You see what's on the bottom corner, though? The Johnny West gun set. Lever action. And we, I told you these stories before, right here. This is what I always wanted. My Mennonite father wouldn't let me have them, but that's a whole other trauma I'll work through with Shelly. All right. <laughs> this is a toy. But over here, on page 84, is the real thing. You don't have to go to a gun show. You order it through the mail. And it came to your door. See, toys have a purpose. Toys allow us to live out our fantasies for our own amusement. Tools, tools have a purpose to feed our families. I put to you this morning, and with this I close, freedom is not a toy to indulge our fantasies. It is a tool to make and build peace. So this morning, here's your freedom. Welcome to adulthood. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the freedom people have, the freedom that the skill brings. Their fingers just dance freely over the piano keys. Their fingers work with pastry and dough, with hearts, minds, children, wood, steel, and livestock. You have blessed us with incredible freedom, but this morning you remind us that that freedom has a purpose, to build up one another, to raise our sons and daughters responsibly, to love and care for our communities and one another. Freedoms of administration that make communities and communities work well. Freedom allows our communities to be safe and strong. Father, we give given the freedom not to build our own kingdom, but to build yours. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And in response... Jesus has given us the ability to be free to worship Him and to, to worship the name of the Lord who has saved us. So stand with us today as we close out with singing. Uh, he keeps me singing. It's number 190 in your hymnal if you want to follow along. Coffee time after. That works for you. That, uh, thank you. And now, may God richly bless you in the grace and mercy won by Jesus Christ through his vicarious death on the cross for all your sins. God bless. You.